Okay, are you happy? Are you a mother? You should be happy. Yay! I'm a happy mother. I'm happy. <laughs> okay. So to, today, well, actually, we've been on a series um, for the month of May. We've been on uh, this. The month of May is our ethos emphasis month. And, and if you were not here last Sunday, ethos is simply the Greek word for uh, culture, the custom, the DNA, the values of a certain group. Uh, so we have been talking about what we value as a church. Who are we? What is the culture of Champion Life Center Cambridge? And today, as Mother's Day, we wanted to connect this celebration with our ethos. Um, but I'm sorry to disappoint some of the mothers today who were hoping to have a preaching that would bash the fathers. But we're not going to bash the fathers. We're going to be nice to the fathers, right? Um, so today, our message is going to be about both moms and dads. And, but we're going to take it deeper in that we're going to be talking about spiritual parenting. So we're not just going to be talking about natural parenting, but believe me, the principles that we will be highlighting today are totally applicable, totally, uh, you could translate it to natural parenting. Let me just be the first one to say that just because I'm talking about spiritual parenting or parenting does not make me the perfect mother of the world. Okay, um, I would be the first one to say that I am no perfect mom, and I'm sure every father would agree that there is no perfect mom. Every child would agree that there is no perfect mom. Amen, kids? <laughs> Amen, young people? Yeah. <laughs> So there is no perfect mom, but we could still be a parent, and it is a privilege to be a parent. It is a privilege to be a dad. It is a privilege to be a mom. And so today, we're going to be talking about spiritual parenting. And I want you to understand that parenting has nothing at all to do necessarily with, with having biological children. Because you could be a biological dad, but not really a dad. You could be a biological mom, but not really be a mom. Um, I, I know of a person, in fact, he's my dad. Not my biological dad. My biological dad was orphaned. His, his dad did not, um, uh, when he was born, his, his dad did not uh, acknowledge him as, as son. And his mom had to work uh, in another province, so he was left with his grandfather. And so my dad grew up with his grandfather, and basically my grandfather, his grandfather, fathered him. And so although he was naturally orphaned, he did not grow up as an orphan. He had a father in his grandfather. So it is not necessarily parenting has nothing. Well, it does have something to do with you having children. But more than that, it's a relationship. And so today we're going to be talking about in our context as Champion Life Center, we value, this is one of our culture. We, and you will notice this. And some, many of you have been familiar with this. We see church as family. And so we recognize that there are spiritual moms and dads. There are those, and, and, and you, if you have not been spiritually mentoring someone, you can be a spiritual mom and dad in, in, in the coming days or in the coming months. We believe that every person has been called to be a spiritual parent. Jesus is our model. Next slide, please. So here we find, how do you know that spiritual parenting is biblical? We see that Jesus is our model. And in Matthew 16, verse 13 to 19, this is the first ever mentioned. This was the first time the word church was ever mentioned. Okay? And so here we see, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Meaning himself. And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And it's a question that God is asking to each one of us. What about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. 
And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just ask that you would reveal. Lord, flesh and blood cannot reveal this truth, but only you, Father. And I pray today that you would reveal this truth in our hearts and in our spirits, Lord God, that you would bear witness, Holy Spirit. We recognize that you are the teacher, not me, not anyone here, Lord. You are the teacher, Holy Spirit. So, Lord, teach us today with your word. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts that are open. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So here we read in this passage that Jesus mentions church for the very first time in the New Testament. He's been going around teaching. He's been going around performing miracles. But this is the first passage in the New Testament that Jesus has ever talked about his intention to build his church. And the word church there is from the Greek word ekklesia, which in their day was a political term. It was, a, it was an assembly of the called out one citizens. The citizens in a city were called out to an assembly wherein they were to make decisions for that city, whether they would go to war against this region or not, whether they would make decisions about forming an army about they would make political decisions and that was the context that jesus was saying i will build my church i will build my own assembly of people called out from darkness into light becoming citizens of my kingdom i will build my church this assembly it's not a building it's not an institution it's a gathering of those who have been called out from darkness i will build my church but he says but it's funny because it's he's using a term that's political in context but he uses a language of family Jesus, Jesus asked them, who do you say I am? And they were saying, oh, you're, some say you're a prophet. You know, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. You're a prophet. You're a good teacher, probably. And, 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 and here's Peter saying, you are the Messiah, not the King of Kings. Peter says, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replies by saying, blessed are you, because he didn't say, God Almighty revealed this to you. But he uses the term, the Father revealed this to you. And so Jesus takes up a political term, but translates it into the kingdom of God and says, my assembly is similar to what you understand as a Greek assembly of calling out citizens and making decisions but this time my assembly is family it's a son and a father next slide please the church jesus has always intended for the church to be built by the son jesus working together with the father if you read through the gospels every time wherever jesus went he would always say if you see me you see my father Whatever I do, I only do what I see my father doing. Basically, Jesus came to reveal the father. He did not come to establish a church of institution or a building or a huge ministry that would be so, you know, and he did not, he just wanted a family. The church is intended to be built by sons working together with the fathers. And mothers. When I, by the way, when I say sons, mother, uh, daughters, please don't. You know, women don't feel alienated. Okay. When I say sons, that that includes daughters. When I say fathers, that includes mothers. Okay. So I don't want to be, you know, be I don't want to be caught up with political correctness. So just giving you the definition of terms. And so it is interesting to note that the first time Jesus talks about church, he uses the language of family. He didn't say. Peter did not say, you are the Messiah, the King of glory. See, because Jesus' role, the title of Messiah, was given to him, not because he was the King of glory, but because he was a son. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9, and I hope you guys brought your Bibles with you, because I know we do have it here, but it's different when you take notes and, uh, you know, take, write on your Bibles, or if it's in your iPad, or in your iPhone, or in your Galaxy, whatever, you know. And so, turn with me to Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, and 
Here we see that Isaiah prophesies about Jesus coming. And he says, for unto us a child is born. Unto us, not a king, a son. Here we see again the language of family. And, and Isaiah says, unto us a son is given. And the government, the kingdom, the government of God, the kingdom of God will be, will rest upon his shoulder. Upon whose shoulder? Upon the son. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. And it's not, and it, you don't see a mention. See, all of, those, all of those titles, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, all of those titles are held together by Jesus walking as a son. Are you getting me? His greatness was not in his own independent identity. His greatness was held together by him walking as a son. By him walking along with the father. By him, you know, having that relationship with the father. And he said, and Isaiah prophesies of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And it's typic and it's so familiar. It, 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 it's similar, sorry, it's similar to what Jesus promised in Matthew 16 earlier. And it says, click please. And I tell you, remember what he said to the, his disciples. No, it's okay. Go back. Forward. Yeah, click again. There was a verse, Busui. <laughs> yeah, click again. There. Today. <laughs> Thank you, Alds. And I tell you that Peter, that you are Peter, and on this rock, what is the rock? The rock of revelation that Jesus is not just a prophet, a teacher, but he's the son of the living God. And his being a deliverer, Messiah, his being a savior, all rested upon him being a son. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome him. Of the will not overcome it. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. See, church, the only way for a church to be overcome by hell is when we start functioning not as a family. Because the intention of the church is to be founded upon the rock of revelation that it's son working together with the father. It's sons and daughters, us working together with the father. It's very simple, but we've made it complicated all, all throughout history. We've made it so politicized. We've made it so fancy with all the titles. And yet, we're still orphans. The church... The church is today must be built. Next slide, please. Thank you. The church today must be built by sons and daughters working together with fathers and mothers, all submitted to our one Father in heaven. Even us mothers and daughters need to be submitted to our Father in heaven. It all goes back to God's original intent in the Garden of Eden. See, when, when God created the earth, when God created the Garden of Eden, it, it, God said, let us make man in our image and likeness, sonship. When you replicate yourself, you're producing a son or a daughter. Let us make man in our image and likeness. The original intent of the father was always to have sons and daughters reflecting his image and likeness. Let us make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over all creation. God's intention was for man to reflect his image and likeness. And as we do that, we take dominion. Authority and dominion, and I'm not, when, when you know, language is tricky, because if we don't define terms, we could easily misunderstand the intent of that word. And when, when you read the word dominion, dominion doesn't mean dominate. It just means, taking dominion, the original word for that just means to manage. And see, we can only manage what God has created if we walk as sons and daughters, and so the church today must be built by sons and daughters because that was always the original intent of God. 
Sin destroyed the father-son relationship and man began to see God as merely a distant ruler, a cruel master, not a father. Sin causes us to see God from a distance, not as a father. It's all about relationships. Next slide, please. Jesus, you know, the Apostle Paul tells us, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the same message of reconciliation. And so church, from the very beginning, God was always about working with relationships. He does not have a purpose without outside the context of relationship. Because purpose without relationship, a command without a relationship, results to a, results to a utilitarian society. I use you because I need you to fulfill my goal. And we've sometimes made Christianity like that. We sometimes function in a utilitarian mentality wherein we come to God and say, use me, God, use me. And it's all about God using us, but not really relating. And when we have that relationship with God about just being used by God, we also tend to use other people. And so here we're establishing our church as a culture that we are not using people. This is not a utilitarian church. We're not just after your giftings. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get close to this person because he can help us do this. It's not about that. It's about I want to relate with you. I want to come alongside with you. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Let's learn together. Let's submit together to the Father what the Word of God says because this is a family, not just an organization. What does sonship have to do? See, God did not send Jesus. It says here, God did not send Jesus to recruit citizens. He sent Jesus to reconcile sons back to fathers. Let me say that again. When Jesus came preaching about the kingdom and say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, he was not recruiting members for the kingdom. He was calling back sons and daughters. He was basically saying, it's like, um, what movie was that? Where, uh, it's, like, it's like a rich man wherein he had a long lost son that's been so far apart from him and he's been looking for that man. And that's not a movie, that's a prodigal son. <laughs> <laughs> it's a parable of the lost son. But <laughs> there's some movies that kind of allude to that. And, and there, there's, a, there's this rich man that has a long lost son, and he sends his, his personal assistant to look for that one long lost son. That long lost son never knew that he was the son of a rich man. And he, when, he went, he, when that personal assistant, PA for short, when that PA goes and, and finds the long lost son, he's not there to say, I'm, I'm here to recruit you to be part of this family. He's saying, you're a son. He's calling me. I, I, your dad has been looking for you. Your, your dad has been searching for you. I'm here to bring you back to where you belong, GMA. And then so here, <laughs> some, some of you don't, can't relate, but we have a TV network where that's their slogan. Uh, slogan, um, where you belong, GMA. Where was I? GMA lost me. Okay, so, so God did not send Jesus to recruit citizens. And church, I want to lay this down. We are not out there looking for, to recruit, to recruit converts. You know that, that term? Oh, he's just, he just wants to convert me. No, we're not after converts. We're after sons. See, I, see, it's not about how many people come here. It's about, do you have that relationship? Because it's that relationship that we want you to have. It's that relationship that brings life and life abundantly. It's not an affiliation to a church. It's not a membership to a church that gives you life. It's that relationship. And it's all about relationship. But it's interesting because we keep saying it's not about religion. It's about relationship with God. And yet, we don't relate with one another. See, church, Paul says, 
He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And so if our message is that God wants to have that relationship with this person, then we ought to also model that message in our lives that we relate with this person because God wants to have that relationship with that person. Are you kidding me? Hello? Next slide, please. So back to spiritual parenting. And I wanted to define that, that spiritual parenting goes beyond leadership and servanthood. See, you can be a leader but not a parent. I'm going to say that again. You can be a good, excellent leader but not a parent. And the reason why I brought up sonship was because only sons and daughters become fathers and mothers. It's easy to be a leader, but it's not easy to be a parent. Amen, parents? <laughs> it's easy to lead. It's easy to lead. This, uh, this is our goal. As a group, this is our goal. Fulfill the Leaders are about goals, performance, results. Parents are about relationship. So it's beyond leadership and servanthood. Yes, we raise up leaders, but we don't want to just raise up leaders. We want to raise up parents who genuinely care for people who really have that, that compassion, who really have that heart. And so, or, you know, we can be leaders, but still act as orphans. And there's nothing more dangerous than for an orphan to be a leader. Because an orphan has insecurities. And you don't have to be a natural, biologically orphan to, be, to, act, to live like an orphan. An orphan will never rule as a father. An orphan rule, rules as a tyrant because it needs that sense of security. Or orphans rule as manipulative parents. We all have those tendencies because of sin. And today we're going to discover those. And correct those. True sons and daughters are not afraid to empower those under them. True sons and daughters, when they become parents, are not afraid to release and let go of their children to their destinies. They are not about keeping them to themselves. They are about releasing sons and daughters. That's what that's our culture is. Many of us came from... Next slide, please. So what is spiritual parenting? Many of us came from a traditional model of church. When I say traditional model, and, and Pastor Knapp brought this up last Sunday, that for us to embrace this culture, there are some paradigms that need to be broken. And one of those paradigms are, is the traditional mindset that we bring with us about church. Many of us came from a model of church wherein it's just priest, attendees, pastor, members. Pastor Nat brought that up last Sunday, right? You remember? Yes. And so, but here at Champion Life, we believe that it's more than just being a member or attendee. It's about fathering and mothering. It's about walking as sons and daughters. It's about leaving a legacy. It's about leaving an inheritance for the next generation. What does that look like? And we're going we're gonna to break that down in a while. And, and, and so, we, we, blah, 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 blah. It's not about you being the ministry head and you being the ministry volunteer. It's more than that. Yes, there is that aspect, but it's more than that. Because if we're not a family, we're just going to be an organization. If, we're not, if we don't have this understanding about mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, then all our relationships are, are based on church. So that we feel awkward seeing each other during the week outside the church. We're not doing any church activity and we're together. We feel awkward because we don't know how to relate with one another if it's not a church activity. That's the traditional model. Are you getting me? That's the traditional model. So when we hang out and it's not a church activity, that's why some of you, we, we, you know, we, we want to come. We want, we want to come to your home and we want to have dinner with you. We'll bring food. Don't worry. You don't need to cook. Some of you will feel awkward because you might have that mindset that, what are, what are we going to do? 
do we have a Bible study? No, no Bible study. We'll just have dinner. Uh, what are we going to do? Did I get in trouble? Am I supposed to be, am I, am I going to be corrected? I mean, you know, we don't know what to do. Why? Because the relationship is so just based on church. Now in here, our culture is more than just church. We go fishing <laughs> sporadically. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we go sleep over, watch Lord of the Rings until we're done. We go, you know, we, we, we can relate. We know how to relate, relate with one another, even if it's not a church activity. Are you getting me? This is the culture we are building. We want to do life together. Because why? We're spiritual parents. We're not just pastors. Are you getting this? We're not just, we don't just relate with you because we need you to do something for the ministry. We relate with you because we want to know you. We want to know your, you know, uh, one, of, one of the young people, Angel, I was telling Angel, I said, she's, she, she was going to have team life last week. And then she said, I said, why don't you come over and we'll have dinner before team life? Because it's always the best time to hang out dinner over dinner, right? Well, we're not after you getting through team life and you got to know what we're about and sign that membership form. We're not in a hurry for that. We want to relate. And so that is our culture. Parenting is about legacy and inheritance. I remember when we were growing up, when my sister and my brother and I were growing up, and I did grow up. <laughs> <laughs> when we were growing up, my dad would always, always, without fail, without failure, always sit us down, my brother, my sister, and I, always sit us down after one of us gets in trouble, okay? Even if we didn't do anything, if my brother did something, he would call for a meeting, and the three of us are, would be sat down, and he would always say the same words. He would say, you know what? When your mom and I die, I can leave, we can leave you with properties and lots of, uh, and a huge bank account. But if we don't discipline you today, you will easily lose in less than a year the, that inheritance. And the biggest legacy that we can leave you is your character. And that's why we discipline you. It never fails. See, I memorized it. <laughs> Verbatim. <laughs> never fails see we could he said he would tell us if you have the right character even if we leave you with a small bank account you'll grow it parents it's about legacy what legacy do you want to leave your children what legacy do we want to leave this church because we're not going to be here forever I mean I know you know we have eternal life but that's uh, the, on the other side of heaven <laughs> Christ's legacy. Next slide, please. Christ's legacy. He had sons, not orphans. He assures his disciples in John 14, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And how did he do that? Before, before the next verse. <laughs> before the next verse. You know, he gathered, Jesus gathered the 12, and these are 12 fishermen. Fishermen, by the way, in their day, were the most uneducated men. If there were any orphans back, back then, it was them. Because they were at the bottom of the society. They were like survival of the fittest. We got to catch fish otherwise. Peter will be grumpy. And so Jesus gathers the 12, and the way he fathers them, was by showing them who the Father is. And he said, and, and he did not just do that. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. When he was about to, to be crucified, he said, I will not leave you as orphans. Don't, don't think like an orphan. He was, I wonder if they were starting to feel like an orphan again because Jesus was being brought to trial. Because they were orphans in the beginning. And so Jesus reminds them, I will not leave you as orphans. You may have lived like orphans in the beginning of this journey, but I will not leave you like that. Jesus makes a way, and he says in the next verse, and I will pray the Father. Here we go again. Father. 
And he will give you, he didn't say, and I will pray for the almighty God, the creator of all things. He refers to God as Father. And you know what he's doing? Every time he calls God Father, he's teaching his, the disciples to call God the same way. In fact, he says, pray like this, our Father. See, and parents, that's why when I, many of you, your moms, would probably talk to you referring to your dads as daddy, right? Well, well you know, with my kids, I would say, ask daddy. Even if he's not my daddy, Okay, next. <laughs> and I just had to pause because Sam just said that this morning. Daddy looks like daddy, like your daddy. Anyway, he says, he says, where was I? Okay, so when I talk to the kids, I'd say, talk to your daddy. I call him daddy in front of the kids, not because he's my daddy, but because I want them to call him that, right? Right? And so, so here's Jesus saying the same thing. I will pray the Father, and he's teaching he, the disciples, come on, he is your Father. Refer to him that way. You're following me. Follow me as I call him. He's your Abba, Father. So here's Jesus saying, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Parents build internal government in their children. Let me say that again. Parents build internal government in their children. That is why, young people, while you are growing up, you hear your moms and dads always saying, make your beds. Repeat, repeat, repeat. I wish we, just re we could just record it, right? It's like, ma 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 make your beds. It gets, it gets. <laughs> repeat. Why? We're trying to build internal government so that that day will come wherein we wake up and your beds are made. And we didn't have to say it. Why? Internal government. And here's Jesus fathering the disciples and saying, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to place inside of you the government of God, the Holy Spirit. He will lead you into all truth. Internal government, not led externally because slaves are led externally, but sons are led internally. Oh, I hope you're getting this. And this is how Jesus left his legacy. You are part of his legacy. You and I are part of his legacy. We've been given the kingdom of God is within us. That's his legacy. Next slide, please. In this church... <laughs> Thank you. Oh, by the way, yeah, thank you. I forgot about that verse. Re rewind, please. The last verse. So when we say spirit of sonship, it is biblical. I just wanted to point that out. Because Paul talks about the Holy Spirit that we received is a spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. It's not a spirit that is, that does, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by that spirit inside of you, you can cry, Abba, Father. Next slide, please. Here in Champion Life, we are not about building a huge church that has many members, but all orphans. Say that again. We're not about building a huge church that has many members, but all orphans. A huge church is great as long as it's not full of orphans, because orphans will always find a way to fight. There's a good fight, and then there's an orphan fight. That's another sermon. <laughs> Last Friday, we had a very wonderful conversation at our care group meeting. And Izzy brought it up that, you know, um, he got to talk about, he got to talk to his neighbor who was a Christian who belongs to a huge church in Kitchener. And, and this, our, her, his neighbor was basically saying, it's such a huge church and they have a very good service, but I don't know anyone. 
I don't know anyone. I, I don't, I'm not connected. And church, that is exactly what we don't want. We don't want anyone coming in and not feeling connected. Now, I don't, we don't want anyone coming in, and it's easy to get lost in a, in a huge church. Now, you can have a huge church but still be connected to one another. And that is why we have care groups because those are, those are, the, those are ways, and that's why we have church camps. Because, yeah, in summer. Because that is our way of connecting to one another. You're not just a number that we count every Sunday. Uh, we don't want ever anyone to feel like he's just a number in the attendance. This is our culture. We, we are intentional about raising up sons and daughters who will reflect our Heavenly Father by following Jesus. Now, having said that, that's the intro. Let's take a look very quickly at what spiritual parenting looks like. Next slide. Thank you. Whoa. Many of you have already grown familiar with that. We call it the four quadrants of the church. And basically, moms and dads, that's what parenting is. Parenting is about creating an atmosphere of family, army, hospital, and equipping center. That's what parenting is. Many of us, we were brought up mostly in our, fa in our own natural biological families as an army. Always fighting. <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to share my personal because, you know, I don't, wanna, I, I don't want you to think I'm hitting, on, I'm hitting somebody, you know, on purpose. So I'll just share my, my own upbringing. In my own family where I was growing up, we were very good at three out of four, family, army, and equipping, never hospital. If you, if you got hurt, that's my dad and mom find the opportunity to equip you how to patch up your wound. <laughs> if you get, there's no, oh, you got hurt, come here. There was no, come here, I'll give you a hug, I'll kiss that wound. No, it was, get a kalamungay, get a, get a, what do you call that, horseradish? Yeah, I think it's horseradish. I don't know. How many of you are rec familiar with horseradish? You know, this, those cute leaves on the playing cards. Or no, that's shamrock. Anyway, so we have a... <laughs> that's, so, where was I? So we have a tree. I don't know if it's a tree. We have a plant in, in the Philippines wherein the leaves are very, very strong medicinal, medicinally. They are very good at healing wounds. Okay? And they just grow. You don't have to plant them. They just grow in, our, in your backyards or in the gardens or in the front lawns. They're, but they're very, very good as medicine to cuts and wounds. They easily close it up. So when we would be playing and I would you know, do my somersault, and I would cry, and I'm like, ah! my dad would just say, why are you crying? Does crying heal your wound? Get up, get, up, get those leaves and put it on your wound. And she, he would show me how to do it, but there was never, oh, why did you fall? Never. So, so please be patient with me. If when you fall, I don't say, oh, really? I would say, crying does not heal you. But I had to learn to function as a hospital to my kids. That's my comfort zone. I'm used to being an army, an equipping center, and I still bring that with my kids so that when they cry because they failed, I say, well, crying will not teach you your lesson. Think about why you failed. So I would always find that as an opportunity to equip them, to toughen them up, and equip them what to do next time so they won't fail. But I would never be, oh, it's all right. I wish. But, so my family was like that, family army equipping. Some of you are probably, you probably grew up more on hospital and family. Have fun and cry together, laugh together, cry together, laugh together. Never mind the household chores, I'll do it all. 
You don't have to learn the household chores. Let's just be family. Are you hurt? Come here. Give me. An, I'll give you an embrace. I will not equip you to do laundry or to. You know, there. Are so many of us. We probably raised our families that way, right? Okay. You don't have to say amen. Some of us are more leaning towards always army and equipping. Okay, get up, make up, make your room. I'll make your room, make your beds, clean your room, brush your teeth, eat your breakfast, and da, 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 da. equipping. You gotta learn, you gotta learn, because when you grow up, you don't have mommy anymore, you don't have daddy anymore, and it's all that. No family time, no hospital time. <laughs> but parenting is the four, four roles. We parents, we got to learn to be a family, to be an army. That is important. We got to learn to be a hospital. I had to learn that. I had to learn. My daughter is so sweet. I had to learn to be sweet. <laughs> She's so sweet. She would just come up to me and just say, I love you, mommy. And I feel uncomfortable because I didn't grow up like that. <laughs> and I would say, aw. <laughs> I love you too. It's not comfortable for me, but I got to do it. That's a parent, right? So, what are the three factors? Oh, by the way, I got to insert a huge word there. Let's go for it, Aldi. Tang. Intentional. It's got to be intentional. To be able to do those four, it's got to be intentional. Why? Because as I've mentioned earlier, we all have our default settings. My default was family army equipping. I got to be intentional when it comes to hospital. I can't parent. I can't spiritually parent. I, I got to learn. You know, I, t I was telling last Friday in our care group, you know, I've learned a lot pastoring this church because back home, I was handling young people all the time. So if I get, you know, if I want to correct, I'll correct them. And, you know, young people back home are different from the young people here. They'll just say, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, you know, and, and I would just give it to them. Army, equipping center. But here, many of you are older than me, more mature. So I got to learn to be gentle in correcting, in exhorting. So it's got to be intentional. Many of us, we all have default settings, but we got to be intentional with our parenting. I'm almost done. Three factors of intentional parenting. What does that look like? Number one. Time. I've met many, I've met a parent that would always say, I don't have time for, for movie night with my kids. I don't have time because I got to work. I got to work. I got to work. Why? Because my kids need food on their table and I got to work. But you know what? Your kids also need your time. Time, we got to be intentional with our time. And it's the same here in church. We got to be intentional in, in our time with each other. Because we will not grow as a family if we don't spend time together. So when we say, you know, you want to go and have, let's go have sushi buffet. Or let's go, you know, that we're trying to spend time with you as, as parents of that, uh, you know, as spiritual parents. We, we want to spend time with you. You know, when we, when we have a prayer meeting and we hang out afterwards, this, no, we're not just wasting your time. But, and we understand that time is very important here in Canada because there are no helpers. And so we got to do everything. So time is very important. But you got to be intentional with your time. As natural parents, as spiritual parents, it has to be with intention. In our family, we make it a point that every week we have our family night. If we have a, our, our family night is always Monday night. But if we have a meeting on Monday night, we move our family night to, Friday, to Tuesday night. In our marriage, we always make it a point to have a date time every week. We must go out on a date. We must. We must. Let's have a date. <laughs> you know, every week we make it a point, whether it's just two hours at Tim Hortons, two hours at Tim Hortons, whether it's just an hour together walking along in the park. Whether it's just watching a movie together at home, we make it a point. We're intentional. We guard those time. We guard it. And we got to do that as a church too. 
We can be so busy doing activities but not really having time to spend together as a family. Number two, identity and value. We got to be intentional in building identity and value in our children, both naturally and spiritually. How did Jesus do it? He did it with his words. He did it with the responsibilities he gave them. He empowered them because when you give your children responsibility, you're actually telling them, I trust you enough to do this. You're releasing, yes, young people. Yes, that's what it means. <laughs> we trust you enough. I love it when my kids would just say, can I cook the breakfast? Oh, sure. Of course, I'm there beside her, and she does know how to just cook by, by herself with a tocino, with a longaniza, with a sausage. She does know that, and I watch her while I'm cooking the eggs, and we do it together, and, and she loves the feeling that I'm giving her, giving her an assignment. Samuel also loves it. <laughs> loves the responsibility of finishing the food. Okay. <laughs> How do we build identity and value in our kids? By the way we treat them, by our discipline and correction. Do you know that discipline and correction adds value? Yes, the house is quiet. Read the book of Proverbs. Read the book of Proverbs. Discipline and correction adds value to you. When my boss in the office corrects me, that adds value to my workmanship. When your father, Jesus said, he, the, the, the Bible says, the father disciplines those whom he loves. Discipline adds value to you. No discipline is fun at that moment. I will have to look for a child that laughs when, he's, when she, he or she is disciplined. That was wrong. Ah! That's wrong, that's wrong. You know, you could never. Why? Because it doesn't feel good. Why? Because it tears something inside of you. But while it does that, it builds something inside of you. So discipline and correction adds value to us. So that when someone corrects us with the way we, we act, with the way we, we talk, receive it as an va added value. Are you getting this, church? That's our culture here. We don't just let you go and do your own thing. Why? Because we're a family. So we, we want to add value to each other with discipline correction. And so factor number three, vision and direction. Parents provide vision and direction. Vision is internal. Vision is internal. If it's external, it's an instruction only. It's a manual, but vision is internal. So that when you apply for a job, you'll, most of the time you find a qualification there. Works with minimal supervision, right? You know, people who work with minimal supervision and they work well because they have a vision inside. It's internal. They don't need someone to keep telling them, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? Have you done that? Fathers provide vision. Fathers instill vision. And that's what we're doing right now. We're providing you a vision of the church. This is the church that we are building, that Jesus is building. It's a family that has these factors of parenting. So we provide vision. We provide direction. God, through the Father. How did Jesus give his disciples vision? By pouring out his heart. Remember on the way to Samaritan, uh, after the Samar his talk with the Samaritan woman, he said, look, the fields are white as snow. The fields are white. Yeah, are, the, the harvest fields are ready. It's ready for harvest. Ask God to send laborers. And it says there before that verse that he was moved with compassion. He was showing his disciples his heart. There are people waiting to be harvested. Fathers pour out their hearts. We pour out our hearts. When we say, you know, I really have a burden for this. You know, we're, we're kind of pouring out vision inside of you. I know, I, you know, this is the last part, the three attitudes of intentional parenting. But before I go there, yes, thank you. When we were going, again, going back to my family, when we were growing up, Every time 
we would have our breakfast and lunch together every Saturday. It's always a free hour, four hour breakfast. Going to lunch. We were still at the table talking. And what my dad would do was he would instill a vision without directly saying it. He would instill a vision in us to have a burden for everyone around us. He would always bring up, do you know I see this? Do you know what do you think can you do with this? He would always bring up problems around us, not necessarily inside the family, around us in our neighborhood. There's really a problem with our garbage system here in this subdivision. What do you think should we do? And what, it, what he was doing was he was building inside of us a vision that would be conscious about what to do for the community so that when we were growing up, we were always conscious about bringing solutions to any problem. We grew up solution-oriented so that we see a problem, we're always thinking of solutions. He didn't tell us, what I'm teaching you is to always find So He didn't have to say that. But by our conversation, he built in vision. And parents, how are our conversations with our kids? Because our conversations bring vision and direction within them. Lastly, three attitudes of intentional parenting. There are lots of attitudes for intentional pr parenting, but we don't have all that time. So we're just going to deal with three. Number one, humility. Humility. Number two would be courage. Number three is selflessness. And let's start with humility. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 7, we are told, In your relationships with one another... Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This was Christ Jesus' mindset. He did have a mindset. And this was his mindset. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. As parents, we need to have that attitude of humility. Because if Jesus, who was perfect, was humble, how much more us, parents, who are not perfect, we need humility. If the perfect one was humble, we, we imperfect parents need to be humble. We need to be ready to admit our faults to our children and say sorry. We need to be ready to say, you know, that was really wrong what I said about you. I'm sorry. We need to be, to be humble enough to say, you know, what my reaction to, your, to, to what you just said was really not right. That was, that was not right. You didn't deserve that, and I'm sorry. We need to be humble. As, as, as your spiritual parents, we, we want to be humble enough to say, oh, I'm sorry I offended you. I'm sorry I didn't mean it that way. This is how I meant it, and I'm sorry that that's how you took it. We need that humility but there's another side of humility because many of us, especially Asians, are very good with, I'm sorry. Oh, Canadians are very good at that too, right? Sorry, 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so everything, I didn't hear you. Sorry, uh, I didn't open the door. Sorry, I, you know, sorry, everything. But there's another side to humility. In the next passage, it says, talks about how Jesus showed humility. It says, Click. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Say obedient. Obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Church, I want to propose to us all that the ultimate humility is humbling ourselves before God. And lowering ourselves before God by putting his word above our preferences. Obedience is the true mark of humility. The reason why we ask forgiveness from the person we offended is because God wants us to. The reason why we bless those who curse us is because God wants us to and we want to obey him. The reason why we, we love our enemies is because God wants us to. And it's not an order, it's a relationship. He's my father. And so we, the reason why we release forgiveness is because God, my father, wants me to. I'm his daughter. I want to be like him. We don't just take on humility so people can say that we are the most humble person in the world. 
Have you heard someone say, I'm very proud to say that I'm the most humble person in this room? I'm very proud of that. We need humility to be, to do, to be spiritual parents, to be natural parents. Number two, courage. Ah. Next slide, please. God tells Joshua when he was about to lead the people of Israel said, Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Fathers, inheritance, family. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. We need courage to be parents. It takes courage to be parents. Right, parents? Takes courage. Takes courage to obey everything the Lord wants us to do. It takes courage to hold our tongue. Takes courage to step out of our comfort zones and model to our children what walking with the Lord looks like. It takes courage to change and align our attitudes to the Word of God. Takes courage to teach what we are not comfortable teaching. Last week, we, had, we went to a Christian bookstore and we bought a book. We bought a book that's really good. Same-sex marriage, sex matters, and tough guys, drama queens. What are these? These are books that talk about topics that parents normally avoid talking with their kids. We intentionally buy those materials because we want to learn how to have those conversations with our kids. Yes, young as they are, they're already asking us questions about sex. Young, why? They hear it in school. Why shouldn't we parents? But it takes courage to enter those waters and talk about those topics we're not comfortable with and talk about it openly with them. It takes courage to deal with issues that may be very sensitive. It takes courage to calmly discuss and co have that conversation with your kids. But it is necessary as parents, and that's why we need to have courage. It takes courage to confront when you are offended and model that to our sons and daughters. It takes courage to discipline and correct. Because many of us have that fear of losing that child if we correct them. We have that fear of losing this person in church if we bring discipline. We have that fear of man. It takes courage to be a parent. It's not easy, young people. And by the way, parenting has nothing to do with age. Well, well yeah, it does. <laughs> But that's not exactly what I meant. What I meant was there are some people younger than us that are more mature as parents. It takes courage to obey God even if people gossip about you. It takes courage to do what is right as a parent because it is needed, because that is the way of love, even if people might talk bad about you. It takes courage takes courage to approach someone and say, can I spend time with you? And I'm not talking about young men coming to ladies and say, can I spend time? Not talking about that. Talking about us saying, yeah, you know what? It's your birthday. We want to treat you for lunch. <laughs> it takes courage to do that because you could always get rejected. <laughs> Sorry, inside joke. And so it takes courage. So number three, last, selflessness in parenting. Jesus said to his disciples, if, anyone, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. And Jesus modeled that kind of parenting, selflessness. What does that look like? Selfless, selflessness with our time. Even if we want to comment on that post on Facebook, but your kid is saying, I need to eat. Pause. Put down the Facebook and cook dinner. Selflessness with our time in discipling people, mentoring people, people that may be slow in getting it. And, and you know, for you, because you're fast. Like, why don't you get it? But it takes selflessness to spend more time. You know, because not everyone is the same as us. It takes selflessness to pray for people. 
Not just bless me, Lord. Give me a good day, Lord. But praying for people. And that's what parents do. Take selflessness with our finances. Believe me, the young people can eat. Lots. So we had to spend a lot. You know, back, especially back home, we always spent money for the young people because we handled the young people. They always came to the house and raided our pantry and raided our kitchens. Say it's selflessness. Selflessness with our preferences. We're not campers. But last year, we let go of our preference because the people, the, the sons and daughters said, we want to go camping. Okay, a camping we will go. But we liked it. We didn't think we were campers, but we actually liked it. Selflessness. So recap very quickly before I show you a, a nice video. Selflessness, okay, three factors of intentional parenting. Next slide, please. Yep, go. Time, say time, read it with me. Time, identity, and value, vision, or direction. Attitudes of intentional parenting, yep. Humility, courage, selflessness. Okay, and now, we want to honor the moms with this video we prepared.